Are you the friend who's always being asked for health advice? Now imagine turning that passion into a fulfilling career with our Become a Nutrition Coach program. Step into a world where your enthusiasm for wellness becomes the heart of your own thriving business. With me as your professor and guide and coach on our user-friendly digital platform, you can learn from anywhere at your very own pace. It's perfect for your busy life. Envision empowering others to live their healthiest lives all while growing a career you love. You're not just gaining a certification here, you're joining a community of like-minded professionals ready to support and celebrate with you every step of the way. So what are you waiting for? It's time to nourish your future and help change lives, including your own. Head over to nutritiouslife.com forward slash BNC for a free class and a sneak peek of the program. Your journey to becoming a nutrition coach begins now. Ever consider that some stress is good for you? Yes, there is such a thing as good stress. Welcome to the Living a Nutritious Life podcast. I'm your host, Kerry Glassman. In today's episode, I welcome Jeff Krasno for a fun, informative conversation on, you got it, good stress. Yes, I said that right. There is such a thing as good stress. Jeff Krasno is the co-founder and CEO of Commune, a masterclass platform for personal and societal well-being. And he also hosts the Commune podcast. Jeff is also the co-creator of Wonderlust, a global series of wellness events. And in 2016, he was selected by Oprah to be part of the Super Soul 100 as one of the nation's leading entrepreneurs. Jeff is the creator of Good Stress, a collection of wellness protocols that he developed to reverse his diabetes, lose 60 pounds, and reclaim his health at age 50. Jeff shared his inspiring story of overcoming depression, reigniting his purpose, and reshaping his metabolic health through his innovative good stress protocol. We explored the critical role of fasting. We talked about cold therapy. We went through resistance training and how those all played a role in revitalizing his well being. For anyone looking to upgrade their health and embrace a truly vibrant, optimal life, this episode is a must listen. So let's do this. And don't forget to rate, review, and share if you love the podcast. Welcome to Living a Nutritious Life. I'm Carrie Glassman, a celebrity registered dietitian nutritionist. Join me every Tuesday on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms as I bring in some heavy hitters to share the latest in nutrition and wellness science. We dive deep into food, sleep, stress, relationships, and so much more. Your weekly guide to a happier, healthier, more nutritious life. Hello, Jeff. I'm so excited you are joining the Living a Nutritious Life podcast today. I am really excited to chat with you. It's uh, awesome to have you here. Oh, Carrie, thanks so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with you and the community that you've built. Finally connecting. I can't believe we haven't yeah. met it, IRL. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I have a hunch that we actually share some genetic ancestry because I am a glassman. So, you are. Uh, well, I, I'm a glassman. Yes. I'm a, I'm a glassman. I always say is my ex married name. <laughs> okay. So, well, so maybe enough. you share some with my ex, which makes this even yeah. more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Okay. Uh, yeah, there was uh, some apocryphal immigrant story of my great grandfather coming to Ellis Island and saying, Ich bin ein Glusman, you know, and then he was given the name Glassman. Um, so anyways, here we oh, are. <laughs> I th we, we're we're going to have to dig into that. We're going to have to dig into 23 uh, and me, you know, po post podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll you, you certainly were the inheritor of the of the sure. brains and beauty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So talking about personal history, meanwhile, I gave mm -hmm. a little intro of you uh, at the beginning of this podcast, but I want to hear from you about your personal story here, because I think you have a really interesting, the little that I know, um, his story and it involves your work life, your your health, and how it all kind of came together with what you're doing now. So enlighten us with that. 
Sure, I'll try to make it concise. And I will say I'm, I'm generally could be categorized as a torchbearer for my better three quarters, <laughs> Skylar, who's a, a yoga teacher um, and just uh, an inspirational <laughs> human being. I but, like that, um, my better three quarters, not even half. You're giving her three quarters. Yeah, I like no, no, that. Yeah, I like it's, that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's five, five sixths on a, on a good day. Um, so, you know, I was really a musician. I grew up playing music in a musical family. My brother's a virtuosic musician. And uh, I was running a management company in a record label in lower Manhattan in the late 90s and early aughts. And uh, I was about a block and a half north of the World Trade Center in September 2001. And uh, that tragedy uh, occurred. And we were kind of in cordoned off in that tiny little radius around ground zero. Um, and eventually about two months later, we were able to get back into our office space and the windows had been blown out. It was inundated with ash and soot. And, um, and our little humble building was full of creatives, really photographers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone kind of in the wake of that event kind of flew the coop. And so there was all this open space in my building and you know you live in new york um mm -hmm. living in new york at that juncture was a just a crazy tumultuous time of you know collective grief but also incredible solidarity mm -hmm. and a uh, feeling of connectivity and it really inspired people to do kooky crazy things honestly and one of those people was my wife and so she opened a yoga studio at ground zero wow and uh that uh, was called Kula Yoga Project. Kula is a Sanskrit word for intentional community. And she opened the doors, if you could call them doors. It was like the most rickety, old-fashioned yoga studio you could possibly imagine. This was well before sort of the Tony Equinox yoga studio on every corner kind of I was just going to say, though, those types of yoga studios have the best yoga. Yeah. <laughs> and certainly the funkiest mats and uh, and a lot of soul. Right. Um, so, you know, she put a little sandwich board out in front of my office and, uh, and you know, people would climb these cockeyed lime green steps into this like one room yoga studio with like the radiator hissing and, you know, the, there's a bathroom like about the size of a bread box. And, uh, you know, I just had a front row seat um, to the power of of yoga and community really to, to heal and transform mm. people. I, I watched, I, I didn't always get into Downward Dog, but I, I watched people kind of file out of that studio and there was a kind of funky stained futon on the, on the floor there in the vestibule and people would just huddle up there and cry and laugh and heal. And I, I just had a, like I said, a front row seat to that experience. And it really just bent the arc of my life, both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. So because most of my life was like backstage at Bonnaroo and Austin City Limits and, mm -hmm. you know, New Orleans Jazz Fest and Lollapalooza, like that was my milieu. Um, so then I, I started to tag along as, you know, Skylar was leading these yoga retreats in the far reaches of the rainforests of like Costa Rica and Osa Peninsula, et cetera. And I would bump along and back of pickup trucks and little puddle jumpers and whatever. And then there I'd be like way out, um, you know, in some eco lodge, you know, with 29 millennial women, like three gay guys and me basically like waking <laughs> with the sun um, meditating, surfing, doing yoga, um, cooking the quote unquote local food. It was just like the food that grew there. <laughs> it wasn't right. like Erewhon or Whole Foods. Um, and then, you know, at night, um, playing music and sharing stories, it wasn't like this, you know, sanctimonious wellness thing. It was like a, a very vibrant kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, people were just living in their full 100% best selves, really. And uh, I had at that juncture, like an utterly ridiculous, in retrospect, like masculine idea, <laughs> which was, how do I scale this? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and it was there that the idea for Wanderlust was born. 
um, which was really kind of a merger of what I knew what to do, which was sort of put on events at the scale of Lollapalooza. But, uh, but around, you know, this community that I had discovered and really fallen in love with. Um, and so, I know, yeah. I obviously know, sorry, just, I know Wanderlust, yeah. obviously, uh, but I never knew the origins of it. So I, I love yeah. hearing that story. It's so inspiring. Yeah. Well, very few people do know the provenance of it. Um, and then, you know, obviously it took a couple of years for it to actually reify. Um, but, uh, yeah, for 10 years, I, you know, ran and built this series of festivals around the world. Um, I think at its peak in 2016, we had 68 in, in 20 countries and, you know, had the opportunity to, you know, connect with all of the thought leaders and mystics and sages and functional medicine doctors and yogis and meditators, right. et cetera, all the people that I, you know, began to read about and really idolize on some level, ironically. Um, and, uh, it was a journey. Like my three daughters grew up within that traveling circus and we, that's all we did. And after about eight or nine years of kind of what I call health and wellness, my adventures kind of took a U-turn into what I now sometimes dub somewhat glibly <laughs> wealth and hellness. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was, you know, in the name of well-being, I was traveling nonstop. I was suffering from wicked insomnia. I was under a tremendous amount of pressure. We had, you know, taken on quite a bit of investment dollars. Um, I was just overworked. And that spilled into this kind of, honestly, such a boring panoply of symptoms and only boring because we've normalized them so much, you know, brain fog, chronic mm -hmm. fatigue, um, irritability, just literally the inability to concentrate at all. I think in, in 2017, I read a grand total of zero books, you know. Yeah. Um, and then just like some some insults to my vanity, <laughs> candidly, like I was like had kind of this dad bod, you know, this sort of accumulation of like adiposity around the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and God knows kind of what my visceral fat was at that juncture. And then um, kind of most embarrassingly, um, kind of these protuberances of flesh on my, around my breasts, <laughs> sometimes known as man boobs, um, more clinically gynecomastia. Um, and we can go um, with man boobs. That's okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. I, I was very unfamiliar with the clinical term at that juncture. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I, I left, you know, I, I sold Wanderlust, um, fortunately in 2018. And I, I just, I went into a deep, kind of depression honestly and um then From, was you know, it, can I, I, ask you, I want to ask you a question yeah. there because so did you go into a depression because you've sold this business and you were now having this like change in your life you were you were upset you'd sold the business you were moving on to another stage or was it a depression related to your health issues or a combination of both yeah really a combination of both i mean i I had a somewhat an, uh, of an acrimonious, acrimonious exit to the business. I was, was essentially forced to sell it, um, mm -hmm. which in retrospect turned out to be one of the greatest things that ever happened, given that COVID came along and crushed mm -hmm. all event businesses. But it was really hard for me to let go, candidly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I uh, along with many itises, I had founderitis. You know, I was just assumed that, you know, they would wheel me on stage at 95 as like, oh, the founder and CEO of Wanderlust. Right. There he is, you know. Um, and, uh, and you know, that was not to be. And uh, it was really hard. I had to let go of a lot of my friends and other, you know, young moms and other people that worked at the company. It was really, really difficult to do that, um, to kind of gussy it up for sale, as they say. Yeah, um, I, I think I think people that, that are founders and that are entrepreneurs like have everybody ha probably has a little bit of that founder itis. And even if you haven't sold your business, I've sold the business and then taken it back. So I, I definitely have a little bit of founder itis in some way. But we've had you yeah. have to you have to work through that. It, and that that is a I mean, that is a whole 
thing. I mean, we could we could do a whole podcast on that. But we'll we'll do a founderitis uh, podcast another time. But anyway, continue a, continue, continue it, it, on. Yeah, it is a, a, a diagnosable disease yeah. for one particular class of people. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it was this combination of 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 basically still clutching and clinging to that mm -hmm. and my identity that was mm -hmm. associated with that because it was everything. I was that guy. I was the wanderless guy. Now I wasn't him. Who was I? I don't know. So right. there was a uh, a searching. But then, you know, really in combination with a lot of the physical presentations that I mm -hmm. described, I mean, it was very heavy, you know, it was like 55 pounds heavier than I am now. Um, and then I put this little device on my triceps and I'm sorry for mm -hmm. people that are just listening to the audio, but it is a little disc that sits on my triceps. It's called a continuous glucose monitor. And um, I looked into the app and I was running fasting glucose levels of 125 milligrams per deciliter hmm. and for those who don't care about that number and that's essentially borderline diabetes type 2 adult onset diabetes certainly well above the normal pre-diabetic range and that was a wake-up call um that was like um like an ice bucket over my head which wasn't uh um deliberate protocol at that juncture what um, made you put the yeah. continuous glucose monitor on like what was the trigger yeah. for that well i had met a functional medicine doctor obviously i knew a lot of doctors this was the ironic piece of it it was like yeah. i kind of thought of myself as healthy and you know honestly carrie one of the i think wake-ups for me is that it's not that it's so extraordinary what I experienced, it's just that it's actually so ordinary. Right. It's like all those symptoms are symptoms that pretty much almost everybody has. I mean, I can run through like the 90% of Americans that have, you know, metabolic dysfunction or the 50% mm -hmm. of Americans that are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And 90% of those people don't even know that they are. They just have these boring, prosaic, anodyne symptoms of brain fog and chronic fatigue. And it's so easy to just write those off as like, oh, I just had a bad day. You know, I just didn't get great sleep or whatever. But just downstream from those symptoms are diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you know, dementia, fatty liver disease, kidney disease, even cancer. Yes, I totally agree with you there because I think there's so many people, you know, when I was seeing clients full time, I, I, people would come in and yeah, they say, I feel fine. I feel okay. I feel this. And then they would start to eat healthy. We change their diet. We change their lifestyle, their sleep, managing their stress. And all of a sudden, you know, they would say things like, I, I, even if they hadn't lost any weight yet, it's like, I feel so clear. I'm energetic. I feel I'm, I'm less irritable. And they, and it's like this light bulb of, wait a minute, I was just living sort of, nothing was so wrong. It's not like I had a migraine each day. I didn't feel, you know, I didn't have a stomach ache. I didn't have this, but I just felt off. But I've been living that way for so long, didn't even realize. I think so many people don't even realize how bad they feel because they haven't totally. felt good in so long. And like you said, the, the terrible thing about that is that has become the ordinary way for people to operate these days. Yeah, we've completely normalized it. And if you feel that way in your 30s and 40s and 50s, right. what you're setting yourself up for is basically this distension of morbidity mm -hmm. where the last 20 years of your life will be riddled with multiple chronic diseases, often uh, treated with sort of a cocktail of pharmaceuticals to to mask you know the symptoms of those things and you know that's really what we're we're looking at um you know in our culture uh in this culture where our lifestyles have essentially hijacked our biology is you know 20 years of what i call sometimes reverse alchemy these are supposed to be our golden years right but mm -hmm. well, we've <laughs> reduced them to sort of the base metals of like bedpans and and wheelchairs etc I mean, this is, uh, and obviously metformin and statins and all of the other kind of stacks of, of pharmaceuticals that go on that. And I'm, I'm not one that's constantly um, excoriating, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. I can identify mm -hmm. places where it's been helpful for people, but our oh, total, yeah. Yeah. but our reliance on mm -hmm. that as the kind of monotone solution Mm -hmm. to masking symptoms 
you know, has led to this phenomenon now where we're sick for the last 20 years of our life, where that suffering and increasing decrepitude uh, is not only awful for the individual, but radiates out in so many different ways to family members and caregivers and obviously the re unbelievable societal economic costs of, you know, it's like 20% of our GDP now, $4.5 trillion is spent uh, on sick care, essentially treating the symptoms preventable and in many cases, reversible chronic disease. So, you know, this was of course like the big wake up for me because I was actually living in the nightmare. You know, I was part of this nightmare and, and not really uh, in the early chapters of it. You know, I, I went finally, you know, I, you go to your, you know, your PCP, your primary care physician once a year, if you don't cancel the appointment, which I often did. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you get your labs done and you off you go and you, you know, you don't hear anything. Um, but I went to my PCP kind of in the wake of looking at my blood sugar levels. And sure enough, my hemoglobin A1C was like 6.5, 6.6%. That's mm -hmm. pretty much borderline diab diabetic yeah. again. And, you know, I have three daughters and, <laughs> uh, you know, I was not going to spend the last, you know, 25 years of my life kind of yeah. limping. So, and you so I had to, you know, I had to instantiate some very considerable change. Yeah, so you put on that continuous glucose monitor. You saw your fasting blood sugar numbers were elevated. So then, what was the next? What was the next step you took? Yeah, well, then I embarked um, on Commune, which is really what I'm doing now professionally. So then you started but, another business. <laughs> yeah, but I started it in a completely different way. I will say, and I still make plenty of mistakes in my life. But I learned so much. I, I never, fr from my wanderlust experience, that I was absolutely dead set on actually creating a business that was both sustainable in itself and also sustainable for me. Right. Um, and uh, and and I've been able to to do that and create a lot of airspace for me within within that enterprise, where I can really. Um, pursue a lot of curiosity that I have around physiological and psychological health and its relationship, honestly, to metaphysical and, right. and mystical health too. Um, and so I went out and interviewed 500 doctors is really what I did. And um, I built this 10 acre property up in Topanga, California, just outside of Los Angeles. And I started inviting people there. Um, you know, Wim Hof came there for three weeks, mm -hmm. you know, Mark Hyman wrote his book there, Zach Bush, all these people that were that I was following. And um, I started to essentially apply all of these different praxis and protocols, some of which are kooky and crazy, um, to my own life. And it just became sort of an end of one experiment. And, uh, and I completely, over time, stacked these protocols, which I have, you know, now call good stress, um, you know, in, into a program for myself that completely turned my life around. Incredible. And, and I love it. It's the, the, again, I'm going to go back to the term you used. The founder itis was still there, but you learned how to manage it and create your next business, taking into account your health. And at the same time, enlightening and educating others around you, which is really incredible. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it took me a lot of, this is a lot of mistake making uh, along the way. But yeah, you know, wisdom is taking your own advice and I take more of it than I used to. I want to get into the stress component here because you mm -hmm. do have this protocol. Um, are you calling it a protocol or program called Good Stress? It's, it's, it's either one. I mean, it, it's a set of protocols, I suppose. Um, okay. But, you know, you could think about it as a program, sure. Okay, because I think... Everyone out there, I mean, especially right now in the world, knows about stress. And, you know, one thing I always like to remind people, when people think of stress, they, many, most people, I think most of our listeners here know about cortisol. And I always like to remind people that cortisol is actually a good 
thing. It's an important hormone and it actually does a lot of good for us. It's responsible for energy. And I like to tell people I know, I'm sure you know this, but it's really, uh, it regulates almost every system in our body, including our mood, our metabolism, our immune system. It decreases our pain sensitivity. It's important for memory, cognition. It plays a really important role. It's, it's not just a matter of lowering our cortisol levels, which I think has been a very common thing for people to you know, talk about now. Um, I need to lower my cortisol levels. I have too much stress, which we all need to, we need to reduce our stress and we need to manage our cortisol levels. But I always explain like there is a good component to cortisol. So your set of protocols called good stress made me think about the good aspect of cortisol, the stress hormone. So I want to hear, you know, your thoughts on that or how you even came up with the term good stress and, and what that really means to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you make that point about cortisol because just like glucose, uh, it's easy to sort of villainize them, right? Yes, yes. But glucose is a very important substrate. You just want homeostatic levels of it. Exactly. And that's the same thing that you want with cortisol. Exactly. You want the, the seesaw of your endocrine system to be home, balanced in equilibrium. To, you know, that's, and the body really is engineered for homeostasis. So like, I'll give you this example just to help kind of delineate between bad stress or distress or chronic modern stress and good stress, or sometimes the Greeks would call it you stress or whatever. Um, so literally just before we hopped on this call, I was hiking up in the hills just right by my house. And I was going down the trail and I was trying to get back to be polite and be on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you so um, much. I appreciate yeah. that. And, um, and about, I would say 20 yards ahead of me on the path, but it's a fairly narrow path. There are uh, like a coyote scurried down and just stood there between me and this studio here. <laughs> and so I was like, hmm, okay. And there was a little bit of a face off. And what naturally happened, of course. You like, thought to yourself, I, I have to make it back for the living and nutritious life podcast. <laughs> That's exactly did. That's exactly right. But, uh, you know, I had to leverage my, uh, my neo-mammalian hippocampal part of my brain, my rational part of my brain to overcome, um, you know, my more reptilian impulses, which was to like run the fuck the other way. Right. So right. I did. I went the other direction at the risk of being late. And, you know, I kind of looked back over my shoulder. And of course, what was I experiencing at that juncture? You know, all of, you know, the normal... Uh, adaptive responses to stress. You know, my heart rate was going yep. up. My respiratory rate was going up. Cortisol was rising, which was sending glucose out to the, my extremities, you know, to give my muscles energy to yep. get out of Dodge, right? My I, my pupils might have been dilating. I don't really know, but, but essentially I was in a fight or flight um, or freeze state. And then, you know, I went about 20 steps in the other direction. The coyote got fairly bored with me. He went off and then I could turn around. And what happened? My body had a completely healthy stress regulatory response. Within a couple of minutes, I came right back to homeostasis. My, my respiratory rate normalized, my heart rate normalized, uh, you know, all of the different kind of physical presentations of, of being in that stress response normalized and that's good and that's a that's is that is a normal physiological response to health but or, or to stress but of course like the coyote just never goes away in modern life you right. know we are triggered all the time and so whether that's through you know constant exposure to to sensationalized or hyper hyperbolized news and social media that is literally designed for our human negativity bias or whether that's through overwork or pressure um, or in some cases like neglect or abuse etc mm -hmm. and this is what traps us in distress or bad stress and that is our um 
that is our primary association now with stress. It's this chronic IV drip that never mm -hmm. goes away. And over time, what that does, as you very, very well know, to your nervous system, to your endocrine system, to your immune system, to your gut is incredibly detrimental. And so ironically though, the body wants some degree of stress. And if you can self-impose certain forms of acute short-term stress, there's actually what is known as a hormetic response. So a beneficial physiological and psychological response to, st to stress, but it's very much like the coyote coming and the coyote going away. And, you know, what I have, what I found in my own personal health journey is that, you know, well-being and health is always a reflection and always emerges from this ability to bounce back, to find equilibrium and homeostasis. And that's true kind of more psychologically, like, you know, we get triggered by someone insulting us or something. And then, you know, and then we come back to center, we breathe and we find, mm -hmm. you know, our psychological equilibrium. Well, that's absolutely true physiologically too, you know, and you can actually look at it from a molecular level. There's almost all these, there's yin and yang molecules and pathways almost all the time. I mean, obviously cortisol is balanced by melatonin, you know, insulin is balanced by glucagon, GABA is balanced by glutamate. You know, you can kind of go through your autonomic nervous system has the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, you know, and to the degree that, to, that, that, that you can actually foster balance in your life, you know, that will be, that will emerge uh, as, as wellness and, and health and vibrancy. And so I, I started to explore like, well, what are those protocols that can help instantiate it and reify that form of homeostasis in my own body. And, and those were the ones I started to, to build up. That's amazing. And I want to dive into some of those specific protocols, but I just want to touch on one thing you said. I, I love that coyote example. I think it's a, a perfect example of how stress and that whole, that whole system is supposed to work in our bodies. But one other thing I want to, you mentioned how you know, you felt your heart race a little bit and your, you know, your uh, glucose, you, not that you can necessarily feel this, but you know that glucose was being released to your extremities to give you energy, <laughs> to energy. Well, maybe you can now. Yes. But yeah, to, yeah. To, you knew that your, you know, glucose was being released for energy so that you could run in the other direction from the coyote. But I think what happens is like, that's one of the reasons I always explain to people when you're feeling stressed all the time, one of the reasons you crave sweets or carbohydrates is because you're, you actually need to replenish that glucose. So you need energy. So you crave these carbohydrates usually very often. That's why I always say like often when you're stressed, you create, you not only are you hungrier, but you crave the worst kinds of food often. Right. So what happens now though, is like you gave that perfect example of that was a very specific situation. You then, you then, you know, came back to homeostasis. Maybe you had a healthy snack. You knew how to manage it if you were hungry, but for many people, they're not running from a coyote they're not grabbing that healthy snack it's not an isolated event like that it is going on all day long every day they're sitting so they're not even active often sitting at a desk and very often there's a bag of potato chips or a bowl of m m's next to them so there's this supply of glucose there's a supply of sugar in a really unhealthy form while they're feeling that constant stress and that's why chronic stress for so many people out there is leading to all of these diseases. And that is one, that is why we're so unhealthy. So I love your example of that acute stress situation and how it can be a, a it is a good thing and it's a necessary component to living and cortisol plays a very important role, but chronic stress, like I just wanted to, I just wanted to kind of bring that full circle of why chronic stress can be so unhealthy for us. So anyway, though, let's go to your protocols. I want to take a moment to tell you about our podcast sponsor, which I'm a super fan of. In today's fast-paced go, go, go world, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and lose focus, especially when you're trying to accomplish critical tasks that require a sharp mind. If you're looking for a way to support your brain health and stay on top of your game, if you know me at all, you know I'm always looking to do that. 
Well then, you want to know about Cognizant Citicoline. This nutrient helps support brain function and it plays a vital role in nourishing and protecting brain cells. Cognizant Citicoline can help support focus, memory, and attention, promote cognitive performance, and support overall brain health. It's also known for its ability to support brain energy and is backed by numerous studies that show its effectiveness. Whether you're a student, a busy professional, a multitasking parent, or anyone looking to optimize mental clarity and sharpness, adding Cognizant Citicoline to your daily routine can help you achieve those goals and support your brain for the future. It can be found in many different products, including chewables, gummies, beverages, and even cold brew coffee. Visit Cognizant.com for exactly where to find this ingredient, and don't forget to look for Cognizant on the label. Um, I want to hear about them because I, I love how you mentioned that if you can teach your body to manage a little bit of stress, it can actually be powerful for you. So if you can put yourself into that coyote type of a situation so that it learns how to get back to homeostasis, it can be a powerful wellness tool. The first thing that I think of when you say that is uh, cold plunging, right? I mean, that's something that's yes. so popular right now. And that that's one thing sure. I know that's one of the reasons that people do cold plunging, but I want to hear about, um, about your thoughts on that and just your, your protocols in general for th this good stress to realign our lifestyles. Yeah. So I'll get into the specific protocols, but to follow up on something that you, you hovered over there, what our modern lifestyle is essentially created through sedentary living or a surfeit of nutrition or nutrient deficient calories or temperature neutrality or comfy couches and comfy shoes, essentially all of the engineering uh, of modern life in the name of convenience and comfort mm -hmm. has created what I think of as evolutionary mismatches, right? So, you know, we were actually engineered to uh, to withstand and to actually grow resilience in the face of good stress. So, for example, we were engineered to for periods of food scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, like actually fat and putting on fat is completely adaptive. It's mm -hmm. a completely adaptive process. You know, I, I sometimes joke and maybe because we're related, we share the same ancestor, <laughs> but I, I, I have um, like a great, 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 great grandfather times 600, uh, you know, who um, lived on the Serengeti of East Africa. I call him Fedge, which is just sort of unimaginatively my name spelled backwards but he you know i try to imagine you know the way that he lived and fedges mm -hmm. like loin loin cloth in the fall <laughs> would get a little tight you know but you know obviously he didn't have to deal with, with how that looked on instagram but that was actually <laughs> that was actually completely adaptive because all fat is is a warehoused energy it's just a repository mm -hmm. for energy for a rainy day and that was adaptive in 10,000 bc because the paucity of winter was around the corner that fallow was right there and so our the miracle of evolution provided this engineering within our body to become a little fat in the fall mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we knew that we weren't going to be able to avail our, ourselves of as many calories but of course now there's this great evolutionary mismatch as you just pointed to where we can grab the potato chips or m ms or dial up like a pineapple any right. time of the year in the palm of our hand 24 7 365 days a year and so we never experience those periods of food scarcity and by extension our body gets this monotone message of just grow 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 store 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 and then of course you look around and there's 45 percent obesity rate so right that so like when I started to actually understand the nature of disease, I was like, it's actually not a bug in the system at all. In fact, most of our modern chronic diseases are the normal and expected outcome right. of our paleolithic um, genome simply coping with our lifestyle. Right. That's it. Right. Um, and you can map that across so many different areas of life. 
So certainly you can map that obviously around food and the mm -hmm. food system. So it's not just the quality of the food, but it's the endless feeding cycle. We never stop eating. Right. In fact, I ended up kind of randomly uh, with some friends at a Denny's. <laughs> That's not where I spend most of my time. But I looked up at the sandwich or the board up top, and there's four meals per day now, Carrie. There's not three anymore. <laughs> there's like breakfast, lunch, breakfast served all day, thank God, lunch, dinner, and now it's late night. It's its own meal. And so Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's yeah. So the four meals a day now. And so really what like a good stress protocols are is realigning yourself with your engineering. That's the way to think about it, like okay. way up here and just living a little bit more like fetch. So we have to actually self-impose some of the stresses that were just customary, that were just part of life that we evolved with. So like fat like i became an intermittent faster okay so, and so that was a protocol that i began to adopt where i consolidated like all my consumption of food within an eight hour window i wasn't like neurotic or fundamentalist about it but like i more or less ate between you know 10 a.m and 6 p.m do you continue to do that now do you stay, or, uh, do you still do that? I, I do, but I'm not as like fundamentalist about it. To, okay. As I was, I was fairly strict for about six months, to be honest. Um, and, you know, there were all sorts of physiological impacts for that, that are, that are some that are quite obvious. I mean, if you're, if you're intermittent fasting, you don't necessarily calorie restrict you can obviously eat like 20 pints of ice cream in a very short period of time mm -hmm. but you're if you're paying attention you're generally calorie restricting to right. a certain degree and the quality of your food consumption just goes up because you're paying attention there's sort of a hawthorne effect to to your to yourself well, and you're skipping and you're generally skipping those unhealthy late night calories like you mentioned because generally when people eat after dinner for the most part it's unhealthy. Some people might have a healthy before bed snack, especially if they're trying to put on muscle. Some people do that um, in a certain form of protein. But for the most part, it's unhealthy foods and excessive calories that people are eating later at night. So you automatically get rid of that, which is a one positive trait of intermittent fasting. A hundred percent. You know, I try to take my last bite of food around seven o'clock and, mm -hmm. and, you know, hit the hay around 10. So leave that three hour window between the last bite of food and, and when you uh, put your head down on the pillow, at least that, that's been my rule. And, you know, there's all these other, you know, pathways that are stimulated. You know, there's this whole, a lot of talk about like autophagy, for example, which is like, you know, this repair cycle. It's part of this AMPK pathway that breaks down dysfunctional proteins into their little amino acid building blocks such that your body can rebuild them into glorious new proteins, et cetera. So there's all sorts of like amazing physiological components to, to fasting. But what I found candidly to be the most powerful uh, byproduct of it was the ability, I want to put this well, I see the ability to delineate between biological need and psychological desire. Mm. So what I mean mm. by that, and this is very um, Viktor Frankl, you know, like mm -hmm. between stimulus and response, there is a space and in that space lies our liberation. So there's a stimulus there there's a stressor there which is like mm -hmm. hunger okay and the typical response to that hunger is sort of a unconscious mindless meandering over to the cupboard right mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you pick something up but if you're fasting it's almost a a, a self-imposed um, mindset technique mm -hmm. where you actually feel the hunger that's the stimulus then there is a pause, there is a space, and you examine the nature of that hunger. And you say to yourself, is this a biological need? Like, do I need some form of energy substrate right now? Or is this just a psychological desire? Am I just kind of eating my feelings right now? I'm not, you know, I'm not feeling top of my game, I'm tired, etc. And the ability to cultivate that space has made fasting this incredibly protein 
technique because it's not just for food for me. It's mm-hmm. also for Instagram and technology. It's it's for retail therapy. It's for drugs and alcohol, honestly. It's like always to be able to find that space mm-hmm. and ask yourself, is this a biological need or a, an emotional or psychological desire? So fasting, I think, is, you know, there's a lot of you know, obviously people need to be careful with fasting, women who are pregnant or menstruating or going through menopause, et cetera. There's all sorts of different dimensions. So I really encourage everyone to, you know, learn about it. And everyone, there's, you know, there's a lot of bio-individuality to fasting, but just as a concept, it is really, really helpful to self-impose times of, of scarcity in your life because we really need to balance th- this message that our body is getting to grow all the time with mm-hmm. a message of r- repair and restore. And uh, I generally believe like culture has yanged us, you know, we're, we're always in a yang state. We're always, you know, growth, 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 awake. Excess, really excess. S- <laughs> excess, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so that, you know, so I will say that, that fasting was a very important protocol for me. And then, you know, I did need to lose weight and I needed to, obviously, because of my, um, my pre-diabetes, I, I needed to really upgrade my metabolic function. Mm-hmm. Um, I had clearly become insulin resistant and, and there was a lot of contributing factors to my insulin resistance. So... I saw my my blood sugar levels really improve with fasting, but where I saw like the most visible um, improvement, in, at least in my my physical appearance, was in the combination of fasting with cold water therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I. I I don't know if there's swearing allowed on the show, so I won't say it, but I go for it. It's okay. It's okay. I (laughs) fucking abhor the cold. (laughs) Like I abhor the cold. Um, You know, Wim Hof did come and stay at my place for a couple of weeks and just out of like risk of pure embarrassment, I had to get into the ice bath. And, you know, over time, obviously, I, I acclimated my, myself to it. And now it's like a, a very regular part of my life, though I don't, I still don't really like it, to be honest. Um, but w- where I saw unbelievable um, progress just in my own metabolic health was prior to breaking fast. So like at 10 or 1030 in the morning, I would take a an ice bath and just so people know, like, there is no exact right temperature. Cold mm-hmm. is actually very, very subjective. It just has to feel uncomfortable. And so you can actually reap the benefits of cold water therapy, even at like, you know, 58 degrees or something like that. And then over time, you know, you slowly bring down the temperature and the duration. So, you know, I was using cold therapy here at my house because I don't have a plunge. Um, I was doing it with a sh- cold shower mm-hmm. prior to eating my first bite of mm. food for the day. And if you kind of unpack that, um, it makes complete sense because, um, you know, if you're fasted in a fasted state and you hadn't eaten for 15 hours or something, you're going to have very, very low blood glucose levels, right? There's not going to be a lot of glucose substrate around. Like your liver is incredible. It's like titrating all the time to keep certain amount of glucose in the, in the bloodstream. And you can generate glucose, you know, through gluconeogenesis uh, on your own. But pretty much you're going to have very, very low blood sugar levels, you know, right. at the towards the end of a fast. And sure enough, that was bore out by my CGM. So then you get into the cold water and what happens? Well, your core body temperature plummets, right? And then your incredible engineering that fosters homeostasis says thermoregulate. We have to thermoregulate and bring you up into the little warm porridge of 98.6 degrees into the Goldilocks zone. So what does it do? It has to use some form of energy substrate to make energy, to make heat, to heat your body back up to that level. But so 
your mitochondria, a lot of mitochondria in this one particular kind of tissue known as brown fat, you yeah. know, searches, right, for an energy substrate in order to be able to do that. And there's very little glucose around. So what does it have as its option? Fat, right. Right. right? So it'll break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and ketones in order to use that energy mm. substrate to heat your body back up because you have very, very little glucose around. And Carrie, I will tell you, I mean, I could almost watch the fat vanish from my body while I was doing this. It was that extreme. And, wow. you know, I, lo I lost 55 pounds um, in not a very long period of time. Now, subsequently, I gained 10 back because I'm trying to, like, actually do more resistance training and I upped my protein and all this kind of stuff. But the stacking of, of fasting with cold water therapy with honestly resistance training being the third one like because the more muscle i could build the more muscle was basically this metabolic i was gonna say yeah the like more metabolic vacuuming yeah. yeah yeah it's like just vacuuming glucose you know out of my bloodstream are um, you those you three together i yeah i yeah. do it every day um okay so you're still and, doing uh, cold therapy the intermittent fasting you're somewhat doing and then the resistance training, it sounds like you've even upped. Yeah. So that 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 was like the third protocol that I started to stack in with the others that, uh, you know, I was never uh, a resistance trainer. You know, I was like, I would call myself like chronic cardio. Like I'd go like, you know, tough it out on the treadmill, but it pretty much just kind of kept me on the treadmill of life. Um, and so I started... Um, I started doing a lot of like uh, body weight exercises. So like 100 pull-ups a day, 100 push-ups a day, 100 sit-ups a day. So I can just do that pretty much anywhere. Um, and, uh, and you know, as I started to hypertrophize, as I started to build more muscle, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that like, again, my blood sugar levels just started to completely regulate because even um, obviously my, my core metabolic rate is going up as I'm building more muscle because muscle is more energy consumptive. Um, but you know, when you're contracting muscle, you don't even need insulin for that glucose uptake into your muscle. And, um, and so, you know, not only was I keeping glucose levels down, I was keeping insulin levels down and my whole metabolic function just changed. Yeah, and I just I became an energy making machine. I just optimized my own ability to make energy. And candidly, that's all we do <laughs> until we don't right. do it anymore. And then we, we move into a different plane. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just shifted your whole metabolic profile. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's su super inspiring. And I love how you took just complete control there. At the same time, you were building another business, which is really incredible. Um, but I love how you shifted. And while you were doing that, you were also really gaining control of your health and really diving into it. And I like that you're still you're still wearing your continuous glucose monitor. So because I, I can see that on you. So you're still doing that, which is great. So I think this is really inspiring for people just even learning how to live a more balanced life. I think there's probably a lot of founders that that listen to this podcast and they're probably inspired that you don't have to be completely stressed out and burning the candle at both ends and not taking care of yourself while you're a founder. Uh, I think it's also really inspiring just that you really, you dove in to figure out how your body works to make it really like work to your advantage that it's kind of, it's doing the work for you now, right? It's like, it's burning, it, it's burning better. It's doing things. It's doing all of the things it's supposed to do in a better way, just by making a few of these shifts and following these protocols. So I think that's really inspiring. And then it's inspiring that you're still doing it. Like you're still going, you didn't just kind of do this, lose the weight and then, you know, fall off. Like many people do, you've really made it into your lifestyle. And it doesn't sound like it's something that's so difficult for you to follow. It really has truly become your lifestyle, which I also think is really inspiring for people. So thank you so yeah, that, much. That's the, yeah. that's the ironic thing, Carrie, is that, you know, good stress is really not particularly stressful. It's not an onerous life. You know, it's actually a life of incredible vibrancy. And honestly, and now I go out, I have a good time. I have a yeah. glass of wine here and there. I'm out, you know, you know, 
I, I think being in community and being with friends is just as important as 100%. being in an ice bath. So, 100%. Totally um, agree with you. That's the love more part of a nutritious life. So I'm totally with you there. Totally. So yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's resetting, you know, your baseline and, and really just realigning the way you live your life with the miraculous engineering of your, of your physiology that's already there. Um, and, and I really do encourage people to learn more about like mechanism. I mm -hmm. spent so much time, you know, learning from people like you and, and other nutritionists and doctors and, you know, that, that the more you actually learn how your body works, it's actually incredibly spiritual process mm -hmm. because kind of the metaphysical is, is patterned in the physical everywhere you look. And so that could be a leaf, but it could also be, you know, your gastrointestinal system. I mean, here we coexist with 39 trillion microbes. I mean, how, how cool, how mystical is that? I mean, that's like, <laughs> we are, we're a super organism living in this crazy holobiont. I so know. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing. And it's wild. We, 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 we've talked a lot about uh, the microbiome and, and gut health in general and all the microbes in our, in our body, all of our biomes on this podcast. So yeah, we, we love that, that again, that's a whole other podcast. We'll need, we'll need to have you yeah. back to, to go, to go deep on that one too. Um, anyway, last question for you. Um, and then everyone, you can get more information about Jeff in the show notes, his full bio, and also where you can find more about his specific protocols, the good, the full good stress program, and all of that. I know many of you are probably going to want to dive in and check that out. So my last question for you, Jeff, though, is, and I think I may have an idea of the answer here, but how do you initiate your nutritious life on a daily basis? Mm, yeah. Well, I, I have a very specific routine you know i have a morning protocol you know i sauna every day and i cold punch every day i think you know more and more what i'm trying to do is actually apply many of these physiological protocols that we just discussed mm -hmm. to other areas of life um more psychology and more social so right now actually i'm actually engaged in a whole series of stressful conversations mm. um, and i'm doing that almost every day where i'm actually leaning into very very thorny difficult conversations with people mm. many of whom don't agree with me um, as a means to try to find some sort of social homeostasis like mm. common ground common humanity cooperation because when I look around in the body politic outside of the human body, mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of middle ground or common ground. And so I'm trying to apply these good stress principles to hmm. having stressful conversations uh, and, you know, utilizing some of the same techniques of like, you know, using yeah. my rational brain uh, over my more limbic <laughs> roots. And controlling yourself not to throw food across the table when you're having those conversations. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. That's how that because I'm just imagining some people thinking, having these stressful conversations, and in their mind, they're just thinking dinner table conversation and things flying and plates shattering and yeah. all of that. But that's not the goal, friends. The goal is to get no. to a place of having the stressful conversations and maintaining homeostasis in the relationship. <laughs> right? No, 100%. I like that. I like I mean, that. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's one that people wouldn't necessarily push themselves towards. Yeah. I mean, it's really conversations that, that stand between where we are and the world that we hope is possible. Absolutely. And, um, you know, if you can have, you know, controlled, regulated, but difficult conversations with people that you don't even know. Yeah. Can you imagine how that can punctuate your life with the people that you love and care about most? But oftentimes we don't have those conversations. And so. Right. And we um, not only do we not have them, we go out of our way to avoid <laughs> yeah, them. Avoid so yeah. I think, right. And, and, and you just even think about it. I think every, anyone listening, think about it. Whenever you've had a difficult conversation, how do you feel after? You always feel better. Even if it was a difficult conversation, you usually, I shouldn't say always, but you often feel 
better. And even if you don't feel better immediately, usually there's some form of growth that comes from it. So I, I think it's a really great point you brought up. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so much. You reg yeah, you know, you gain skills through tools in life. Um, and this one is, you know, to regulate your nervous system mm -hmm. such that, you know, you can create a setting uh, of safety and security because that's the only place where healthy relationships are actually formed. It's not well, to actually achieve any solution or agreement. It's actually to find connection. That's it. Yeah. I will. And, and when you brought up the difficult conversations, the stressful conversations, that was one of the, one of the things that was going on in my head, thinking about that. Like if we could have mm -hmm. certain conversations, I think the world could be a whole lot different, right? Yeah. If we could, but yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. This was amazing chatting with you. And I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Everyone check out the show notes and go check out the Good Stress Protocol.